Diplomats invoke a rarely used resolution at the UN General Assembly to try to stop Israel's war on Gaza after the United States vetoed a Security Council attempt to call for a ceasefire. Is the veto power paralyzing the UN? Should it be permanently revoked? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Cyril Vanier. The emergency session of the United Nations General Assembly is bringing Israeli massacres in Gaza into sharp global focus. After more than nine weeks of violence, the UN Security Council has been unable to agree on a ceasefire. Warning of a global threat, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres invoked a rarely used article last week to urge the Security Council to act. But despite an overwhelming majority voting in favor of a ceasefire, the U.S. blocked it using its veto power. Critics say this absolute power of the five permanent members of the Security Council renders the world body helpless at a time when global conflicts demand timely solutions. So is it time for the veto power to be removed? Will it help the U.N. become more effective? We'll discuss these issues in detail with our guests shortly. But first, this report by Fintan Monahan. UN diplomats get a closer look at the war in Gaza. The Rafah crossing is the only entry point for humanitarian aid into the territory. Nowhere near enough is coming in, and most Palestinians are prevented from leaving. When you see it with your own eyes, when you visit the hospital, when you, when you see how the humanitarian assistance is being, is being uh, basically, basically prohibited, to enter, to enter Gaza despite, despite the catastrophic situation, dire situation. This is uh, really uh, a tragedy and uh, it has been too long. We have uh, suffered too much. So for the Security Council definitely uh, to maintain peace and security is our primary responsibility. And uh, we have tried very hard and of course we, we need to do more. The visit was aimed at building international consensus on the need for a ceasefire. Last week, a resolution was tabled at the UN Security Council, but was vetoed by the United States. The UN Secretary General said he would continue to press the issue. Regrettably, the Security Council failed to do it. But that does not make it less necessary. So, I can promise I will not give up. ...of civilians and upholding... There's been more success at the General Assembly, where every state has a vote and no one has veto rights. On October the 27th, it passed a resolution calling for a humanitarian pause. But UN General Assembly resolutions aren't binding. When the UN was founded in 1945, the Charter gave special powers to five permanent Security Council members. The US, the UK, France, Russia and China. Each has a veto and has used it extensively over the years. The U.S. has blocked more than 40 resolutions on Israel. Critics say the current setup isn't working, as the international community is unable to respond effectively to global crises. There's been many proposals for reform, including limiting the veto and expanding the number of permanent members on the U.N. Security Council. Not one has been implemented. Israel's bombing campaign has killed or injured tens of thousands of Palestinians. Most of Gaza's population has been forcibly displaced, many families several times. Israel has rejected calls for a permanent ceasefire and has pledged to continue its assault, despite growing appeals for an end to the violence. Fintan Monahan, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests. In Northern Wales is Khan Ross, the founder of Independent Diplomat, a non-profit advisory group. He's also a former British diplomat who served on the UN Security Council. In Islamabad, Maliha Lodi is a former Pakistani ambassador to the United Nations and was closely involved in discussions about the reform of the Security Council. In Moscow now is Vyacheslav Matusov, former Russian diplomat, chairman of the Russian Friendship Society with Arab Countries. Welcome to you all. Khan, first question to you. 18,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of them women and children, and the UN Security Council is not able to call for a ceasefire, even though most of the world wants to see the fighting stop. 
Is the UN failing at its primary mission? Yes, undoubtedly. I mean, the UN Security Council is the world's primary body for peace and security, for peace and security. And the U.S. has blocked any action, as it has traditionally done, on Israel-Palestine issues. And on this occasion, it has clearly blocked Security Council action. So now the action goes to the General Assembly. So, uh, by the way, just to make this clear, at the time of recording, we haven't yet seen the vote of the U.N. General Assembly. It'll happen in a few hours. Um, there is likely to be overwhelming support for pause in the fighting, um, and it's probably going to be called a ceasefire in the language that they're looking at. Maliha, Maliha we, have, we have many viewers from what could be called the global south on Al Jazeera. What are they supposed to think when they see major powers, on the one hand, promoting international rules, and then blocking the only multilateral system that we have to uphold them when it suits their interests? Well, I think most people in the global south would be extremely disappointed, but not surprised by the way that the Security Council, the way it's structured, uh, is, is uh, not working. Uh, I think at the heart uh, of its dysfunction uh, lies the fact that we have a structure of the primary body responsible for the maintenance of international peace and security, uh, which reflects an arrangement of a bygone era. Uh, I mean, the, the five permanent members are there because of uh, the Second World War arrangement. And now mm. the Security Council needs to reflect current day global realities, which it doesn't. So I think there's disappointment in the global South, but there's also a sense that this body must be radically reformed if it is to live up to the responsibilities of the 21st century, because it does not reflect 21st century realities. And for that, it is important that either the, uh, the Security Council is reformed in a manner that you increase uh, the number of elected members who can then balance the power exercised by the P5, uh, or you move to end the veto-wielding uh, powers uh, even though I think that will be a very difficult, difficult thing to do, because any reform of the Security Council, with which you know I have been involved in the negotiations for almost five years, uh, any reform would involve an amendment to the Charter of the United Nations. And that means that a two-thirds majority of the General Assembly will be required, and then mm -hmm. ratification by all those who have voted for it, including the five permanent members. So here's the dilemma or the problem. The problem is that the five permanent members of the Security Council do not wish to give up its veto. And therefore, we're looking at a situation where there have been recently moves by the General Assembly to try to at least limit or to embarrass uh, the permanent five when they use uh, the veto. And I think we should remember the countries that have used it most. Uh, it is the United States and Russia. Mm. Uh, the United Kingdom is the number three country that's used the veto uh, many times. But China and France have used it less. So the two countries that have used it most, uh, you know, that underlines the fact how they've either tried to shield themselves or their allies uh, from censure or from any kind of action, which leaves the Security Council dysfunctional, ineffective, and lacking legitimacy. Okay. Vyacheslav, I want to bring you into this conversation, but before I do that, quick little explanation to make sure all our viewers are up to speed on just the very basics of how the UN Security Council works. The UN Security Council, or UNSC, is 15 members, five of which are permanent, and they are essentially the victors of World War II, which is when all of this was designed and, and built. And they are the US, the UK, Russia, China, and France. And those five only have the right and the ability to veto any resolution that comes to them. Okay, and that's what we're talking about today. So, Vyacheslav, I, I want your take on this as a former Russian diplomat, because it, on this particular conflict, the war on Gaza, countries have been critical of the U.S. vetoing a ceasefire. But there's another conflict going on, still going on, of course, Russia and Ukraine. And on that conflict, it's been the other way around, with Russia... Uh, vetoing any attempts to impose a ceasefire in that war. So we see that the major powers use the veto when it suits their interests. What is your take on this, this issue of the veto power and whether it's blocking the UN? Of course, uh, if we'll have a look at the current international affairs, we'll find out that 
UN organization was established after, as a result of Second World War. There, pragmatically speaking, it was two powers uh, that split it and support, uh, and they in in one sense against the Germany, United States, and uh, Soviet Union. It was uh, 80 years ago, and now we facing other things that two big powers, America and uh, Russia, who replaced the Soviet Union, split absolutely different positions. And now, if you look, have a look at their situation in Syria, where uh, 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 Russian troops facing uh, American troops in Deir Azor, in uh, uh, on the borders of Jordania, Jordan, and uh, uh, also on Ukraine, where they are fighting. And the Russian view on what situation in Ukraine is Russia is fighting not U Ukraine, Ukrainian military forces. That's right. Well, but uh, uh, for these forces are supported fully. But my question is about the UN. My question is about veto power and, uh, in the UN, Vyacheslav. Uh, veto power, it is necessary thing. What agreed on in the, the 80 years ago, it was a, 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 a compromise to find a compromise to satisfy United States and Soviet Union. <coughs> now, where the Russian Federation is in the state of war against the United States, to find a compromise, a, a, a common solution, it's not, it's very difficult if you look at details on any conflict, mm. not only in Gaza. Why remind you uh, 2006, the situation in Lebanon, when the Israeli army, two months, was bombarding their own allies in Le Lebanon, Christian, Maronite, uh, militia, uh, who was destroyed by Israeli strikes. Uh, rocket strikes, bombing. And why? Because Condoleezza Rice at uh, that time said, the, in, in Lebanon, we are creating a new big Middle East. Wait, the question the I really want an answer to is how the UN works, works or doesn't work. Plan, plan that is conflicted, con conflicted with uh, the situation in United Nations in Security Council. Of course, two different positions. They cannot, two main powers didn't have opportunity to find a solution, common solution, because America considered Russia lost, Russia, Soviet Union lost, Russia is weak country, we can't can take into consideration okay. their uh, desire, their plans, their uh, position, and only the United States can dominate. Well, now we have a plan. A plan on Gaza, on Israel, a plan, it is called Deal of Century. It is signed by, uh, as we said, or discussed by v Vyacheslav, uh, if you Donald don't mind, Trump, I'm going to have to Jordan jump in, Putin because I really want to... Netanyahu. Vyacheslav, I'll have to jump in, because I really want to keep it about, about the UN mechanism right now for preventing conflict and keeping the peace. That's really our focus today. Khan, we just heard two different positions. One, essentially saying we need to, the UN needs to be more inclusive in its decision making, and that means perhaps get rid of the veto or widen the veto power. And another, Vyacheslav, saying veto is necessary because it's a compromise between uh, the major powers. Now, you were a British diplomat, and you resigned, this is interesting, from the Foreign Office after the Iraq War. That's when you founded your advisory group, Independent Diplomat, diplomat because you figured that there was a democratic deficit, your words. Tell us about that and how that applies today. Well, it applies because um, many, many smaller countries and non-state groups, many of whom are involved in conflicts or disputes around the world, are not entitled to speak uh, at the UN Security Council or indeed other UN bodies when their issue is on the table. So Independent Diplomat was founded to address that problem by giving smaller groups, democratic groups, only democratic groups, the tools, the diplomatic means to get at those Security Council members or General Assembly members in other ways, for instance, by organizing
organizing private informal meetings. But the, 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 the earlier speaker who talked about the democratic legitimacy of the Security Council was absolutely right. It's not a legitimate body in that its membership is not representative. But the paradox is you make it larger and perhaps expand, extend the use of the veto to other new permanent members, and that will make it even harder for the Security Council to reach agreement. And one of the paradoxes of what your Russian contributor said is that the veto is indeed in some ways necessary because it forces the big powers to agree or not to agree to a particular resolution. If they don't vote for a resolution and they can't veto it, they may well say, well, why should we implement it? Or why should Israel implement it in the case of Gaza? Because we haven't voted for it. And that's a paradox of the veto in, in a sense that it forces the big countries to ad adhere to the rules agreed by the Security Council or not. So in your view, should veto power be retained and perhaps modified or should it be scrapped? I think it should be modified. I think there should be consensus in the General Assembly to limit the use of the veto. So Liechtenstein, the little state Liechtenstein, has proposed a reform whereby the veto could not be used in the case of mass atrocity or war crimes. And I think that's a very sensible reforms and reform, and many other countries would support that. And I think I think that's reasonable. The other re reform is that Security Council members, permanent members, should be obliged to explain themselves to the General Assembly when they use the veto, when the General Assembly might then take up the issue, as they have done on Palestine today. Maliha, do we still live in a rules-based order if the majority will of, of the majority of countries in the world, as it's been expressed by the General Assembly, is blocked by just a handful of countries, can be blocked by a handful of countries? Well, of course, the answer is no. We do not live in a rules-based international order. But I do want to address something that you talked about earlier, which is uh, the idea that expanding veto-wielding powers will somehow help the Security Council. I didn't at all uh, mean that. Uh, I meant one way that the Security Council can be reformed to be more representative, more accountable, and more current uh, to reflect uh, today's realities is for it to expand by adding elected members. Mm. And the idea would be that that would help to balance the power of the P5, because the P5 are not going anywhere for now. If they're not going anywhere for now, then, of course, the answer also lies uh, in initiatives that have been taken. For example, there's a French-Mexican initiative to try to limit the use of the veto so that it is not uh, used in cases of mass atrocities. And then there's also a European uh, initiative some years ago uh, which aims to limit the use of the veto uh, in cases where uh, there is a humanitarian uh, situation. But these initiatives are there. There's growing support for them uh, amongst members of the General Assembly. Uh, but clearly, they haven't been able to uh, achieve their objective because they have not been implemented. They've not been agreed to. Maliha, uh, Maliha by what's, the, what's the most realistic plan B at this stage? There have been many avenues for reform that have been proposed, that have been considered in various forums. What's the most realistic plan B? Well, I think it's hard for a realistic plan B to come into play until mm. the P5 themselves agree. And I think that is what lies at the heart of the problem. Mm. Uh, I mean, the problem and the solution are the same. Uh, the problem is the P5 with their vetoes, but the solution also lies in them voluntarily uh, giving up uh, or at least limiting the use of the veto. But we don't see that happening. So I think the General Assembly membership has tried to counter that uh, by initiatives like uh, ensuring that uh, the use of the veto is explained to the General Assembly. I mean, this happened last year through a resolution that was adopted uh, by the General Assembly. Uh, and, of course, uh, this led to an open debate uh, in April this year by the General Assembly of the use of the veto, uh, which was the first time that a major debate took place. Plus, don't forget that over two decades of negotiations in what is called the intergovernmental uh, negotiating process at the United Nations in the General Assembly has not produced any outcome. But mm. what it has done is to highlight the need for reform of the Security Council and the need for accountability by the P5 to the General Assembly, mm. which, after all, is the parliament of the world. Mm.
Well, speaking of Parliament of the World, it's interesting you say that. Um, and Vyacheslav, I'll come to you with this next question. I want to pivot to Resolution 377, because um, in the absence of a resolution two days ago uh, by the UN Security Council, the General Assembly said, OK, well, we're going to invoke this, this rule that we don't use very often, which essentially gives us expanded powers. Um, the primary purpose of the United Nations is to keep the peace. The UN Security Council is not calling for a ceasefire, so we're going to try and do this. It's our turn. And by the way, the General Assembly represents the will of almost every country in the world, right? It's 193 countries, if I'm not mistaken, at the General Assembly. However, however, what they pass is non-binding, unlike the resolutions of the Security Council. So my question to you, Vyacheslav, is this just a pressure tool, then, a pressure tool, in this case, aimed at applying pressure on the U.S.? Well, my private opinion that there is pressure on U.S., of course, it's very important because previous uh, voting for a previous uh, project of resolution in uh, Security Council, only the United States and Israel supported uh, pragmatically, uh, uh, opposed pragmatically uh, ceasefire resolution. <coughs> I think that even the United Nations General Assembly adopt to 90 percent of voices for, uh, to support Palestinian and demanding stop killing. Who is who fulfill this decision? General Assembly, Security Council, uh, uh, or Israel, only Benjamin Netanyahu. Today, I believe that the United States, I am embarrassed with the situation in Gaza, is trying to prove, to, uh, to influence on Benjamin Netanyahu and Israel to change their attitude and to stop uh, bombing, to stop uh, killing people. But who is taking decision, real decision, on the ground? Benjamin Netanyahu, if mm. he refused to what it will be uh, measures against him if Security Council is ready to undertake any real steps to, uh, to impose their decision to those who don't fulfill it. Well, America, as it obviously uh, today, is uh, choosing other way. She is not opposing desire Benjamin Netanyahu. Why? Because there is a plan, plan of deal of century that I mentioned. That means that no Palestinian, no Arab on Israeli territory, all of them should be outside the territory. Why they are blaming now Egypt? Why they are blaming now Jordan, who don't accept refugees? Because they are understanding very clearly examples from the previous decades. When they live in their houses, they live in their territory, they live in their soil, they became refugees outside the country. And the plan of century, deal of century, is consist to, to create a new situation inside Israel without any conflict, confrontation with local people, Palestinians. I think that this plan of new frontiers of uh, 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 in the Middle East, it can, also we can mention the situation in Syria, in Turkey, well, in Iraq, Islam, if you allow me to jump Iraq, in respectfully, where is creation of hmm. yeah, because you, you've play, mentioned gorgeous state. It's yeah, if same, I can, if I can jump in, you've mentioned the deal of the century multiple times. So that was the nickname given to. Um, what the Trump administration had proposed to the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's not active in any way under the Biden administration. Um, however, Biden has addressed this. This is how Biden acknowledged the importance uh, just recently uh, of global public opinion. This is what he had to say. We continue to provide military assistance to Israel to, until they get rid of Hamas. But, but we have to be careful. They have to be careful. The whole world's public opinion can shift overnight. We can't let that happen. We're working relentlessly for the safe return of the hostages. 
So, Khan, you heard that. The whole world's opinion can shift overnight. Until now, the U.S. Has, had seemed fairly impervious to, uh, to pressure from other countries. This is one of those little data points, if you're reading the situation carefully, that suggests maybe, maybe, actually, they, they are taking this into account. Oh, they certainly are, and they always have been, even if they may not acknowledge so in public. Of course, countries, even ones as powerful and as dominant as the United States, care a great deal about the what what the rest of international what the rest of the international community think about their actions, and they will be feeling very exposed. They don't like uh, wielding the veto in the UN Security Council. It makes them look very isolated. The vote in the General Assembly will demonstrate the same thing, that there is a large majority of countries in the world who want to cease fire, and only the U.S. and Israel and a few allies oppose it. And that's not a comfortable position for the U.S. to be in. And likewise, Israel. Israel says it doesn't care about international, international opinion or the views of the U.N., but it actually does. And this will exert a certain kind of pressure on them, on the U.S. and Israel, to ultimately stop military action in Gaza. I don't think it will be a military imperative that stops the action in Gaza. Whatever the Israelis say about it, I think it will be external diplomatic pressure. Hmm. Maliha, do you think then that there is a breaking point, so to speak, for the U.S., where the international pressure becomes such that the U.S. stops using, for instance, its veto power and shielding Israel from a, from a U.N. Security Council call for a ceasefire? Well, if it uh, was there, it should have happened by now. Uh, look at the scale of the killings in Gaza. Look at the number of children uh, who've been killed. Look at the terrible uh, calamity that has befallen uh, Gaza. Uh, global opinion is very clear. Global opinion has been expressed in the previous uh, UN General Assembly uh, resolution. It has been expressed in demonstrations that are taking place across the world. And yet the United States seems to not be responding to this. Uh, there's a disconnect between what it says and what it does. It's not new. Uh, we've seen it happen before also. But the tragedy is that by the time the United States realizes it, uh, what will be left in Gaza? Uh, the death and destruction there, uh, and the fact that the United States continues uh, to provide Israel with weapons and high-tech weapons at that, while saying that it wants to protect uh, civilians in Gaza. I mean, you cannot get a more uh, bigger disconnect uh, than that. So unfortunately, these double standards and the hypocrisy uh, of the U.S. position is something that is being noted across the world. And there will be a diplomatic cost for the United States. But for now, it seems to be impervious uh, to the global opinion. And that's all the time we have for today. But I'd like to thank all our guests, Khan Ross, Mili Halodi, and Vyacheslav Matusov, for taking the time to have this conversation today. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, do go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Cyril Lanier, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.